Um, as I said, it's Defrost 67 um, on a very hot day in Australia. Um, we've been doing these talks for the last 12 years, so a long time. Um, kind of padded out. Sometimes they're every month, sometimes they're once a year. <laughs> um, but we thought it'd be really cool to do one here in Brisbane. We're doing, we're doing a lot of work in Brisbane over the last two decades. We just love coming together with uh, creative people, architects, interior designers, planners, city planners, etc., developers. We're passionate about design. We're passionate about designing a better world. And these talks are really about not us talking to you, but for all of us to get together and help kind of expose everybody to each other. Um, having some nice food, some lovely paella and some nice wine. And really just sharing ideas because we, all of us, need to collaborate to do things better. And uh, these kind of open discussions that we kind of instigate are really about kind of getting insights from a whole variety of people who I'll, I'll introduce you to shortly. Eco Outdoor, as I said, David, thank you very much for putting it on today uh, in this wonderful space. Um, we have actually recently rebranded Eco Outdoor. New signs going up out the, out the front there. Collateral here that you guys should steal and help yourself to. It's really cool because Eco Outdoor is also part of the whole ecosystem of architecture, cities and building and designing and making. Uh, and they're passionate about beautiful materials and, and materials crafted with wonder. So we're here today to talk about cities by design. We really want to focus on creating places, destinations, environments, workplaces, public places, etc. We want to work together, and we do work together with a whole, whole array of organizations in trying to create better places for people um, and have better experiences, not just for now, but for the future as well. Some of the projects we've been working on recently is the, the rebranding of the Meyer Center to Uptown. You guys in Brisbane will be very familiar with that uh, Brisbane icon. And a serious mixed-use uh, precinct with ISPT that's under wraps for now. And the new Sky Garden commercial development with GPT. As well as signage and wayfinding for uh, Logan Hospital. And the new service Australia HQ with Woods Baggett. I'm Vince Frost, the founder and uh, I don't even know what I am. I call myself, <laughs> I call myself Creative Connector uh, lately. I am the executive creative director and the CEO, but I find calling myself the creative director, it might sound a bit wanky to some people, but for me it's more appropriate in terms of what I do, in terms of connecting people. Uh, I love doing that, and our organization is passionate about and optimistic about each day and opportunities that lie in front of us, not just to make money, but to actually help people in a positive way. So doing good is what we're all about, and I'm sure all of you guys are too, as well munching away on the paella. Really excited about hosting tonight's event and with some of the leading voices in the Brisbane's uh, built environment community. Um, Michael Stott, do you want to come up first? He thought he was done. Michael is a head, head of cities and places at DBI, an accomplished urban designer, placemaker and strategic planner. And he spent the last 20 years working around the world on city shaping projects that create livable places for people. Welcome, Michael. Audrey Penny, come on up. We need a drum roll. Audrey is Associate of Strategy and Sustainability Innovation at ADP Consulting. Audrey has over 20 years experience working in sustainability across multiple capacities. With a passion for our biomimicry, she'll explain later, uh, she advocates for biophilic design as best practice and takes a regenerative approach to ensure the built environment is resilient to climate changes. Welcome. <laughs> Troy Casey. Troy Casey, come on. Come on up. He, he offered to take over this my role, so I'm like, I want to see how he goes. Uh, Troy is a proud uh, Kimilaro Kimilari. Camilla Roy. Camilla Roy, I got that right in the end. Man, and a managing director of ba uh, Blacklash, an Aboriginal design studio specializing in country center design and cultural placemaking. Troy is passionate about harnessing economic opportunities to create positive social change for First Nation Australians. Welcome, Troy. <laughs> Kat Burgess. Kat is. <laughs> 
Um, Kat Burgess is the head of our place uh, team at, at Frost Collective. Uh, a skilled, experienced strategist, Kat's passion about uncovering genuine truths and that give places and organizations creative direction and meaning. She was a respected ex expert on place, destination, and business branding has played a pivotal role in bringing to life brands of city shaping places across the globe. Welcome, Kat. We're one of the fastest changing cities in Australia. You know, Brisbane is an incredible place. You've got the Olympics coming up very shortly and everybody's focused on 2032, which seems a long, long way away. But when you're designing a city, as you all know, you're thinking not just of the Olympics, but for future, the future generations as well. And one of the projects you might be working on might not even start to 2032, you know, so a lot of these projects are long term. Um, you have a phenomenal population growth uh, and industry growth in the city and it has been for a while now. I want to start asking a question to all of you, one at a time, of course. Uh, what, is the, what, is, what is the one completed project in Brisbane now that you feel has seriously elevated the city uh, from a design perspective? You can't say the eco outdoor showroom. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll start with you, Michael. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question because there has been, uh, particularly in the last few years, quite a few good ones. I, I would say that Howard Smith Wharves is probably our mainstay bragging rights uh, mm -hmm. project. Uh, the, w when it went out to tender or for the EOI process, you know, we had the kind of requisite high-rise, uh, kind of large, typical river-fronting towers. Uh, that were all part of the bid, and um, Adam and his team that actually wanted wanted on a bit of a song and a dream, um, mm -hmm. and only had at the time it was a, a different hotel, but the but felons were that kind of main piece, and you can go down there any night of the week, and it and it's busy. I'm often surprised, 2 p.m., 1 p.m. in the afternoon, it's busy, and yeah. and I think it's just unfortunate that it's such a small part of our river. And uh, I, I think probably where, pe where people gravitate the most right now is actually towards Howard Smith Wolves. I think I, I love walking around cities, and I did that today uh, for a bit of exercise, but to um, uh, have a look around the city. And, and any city you walk through, uh, whether it's New York or Tokyo or London or Brisbane, um, there's always pockets, isn't there? There's pockets of really cool spaces of, of, of new ideas. There's lots of pockets of r terrible places. Um, and I guess, like you, I probably feel like that's opportunity. That's opportunity over time to connect the dots and actually steadily improve the city. Audrey, what's your uh, favorite place? Um, Take your time. Thanks. <laughs> the hills? No. Um, I, I've got two, actually, and I think uh, I'm not from Brisbane. I haven't lived here for that long. I've lived here for seven years and I'm still acclimatizing, hence I'm still clinging on to this water for dear life. Um, but two places. So I have to say one of them is South Bank because my brother lived in Brisbane and I lived in Melbourne and I couldn't understand why he'd moved to Brisbane and he couldn't understand why I'd moved to Melbourne, which is <laughs> akin to Scotland. But I remember coming to South Bank before it was actually finished and, and the, the beautiful landscape that it is now. And I took my young children there and we stripped off as soon as we saw that water and kind of, uh, kind of dove into it. And it was just such a, a relief. It was such amazing, like coming from Scotland, amazing to have access to that kind of amenity and recreation in a public space was yeah. unheard of so I absolutely loved it and then to watch the evolution of that space has been really amazing and I yeah it's just something that I have a very strong emotional connection to and the other one I'd have to say is Fish Lane I absolutely love Fish Lane I just love that use of space yeah. that's enough Fish Lane <laughs> <laughs> okay I'll stop t I'll stop no, you, got, you don't get two there's only three left no, like no. it was favourite place and Fish sure. Lane is oh mine. Troy's on okay Troy you're next <laughs> Yeah, it was it was brilliant. Um, thank you. <laughs> Jeez, I'm loud, so I might hold it down a little bit lower. Um, Fish Lane is a really amazing precinct, and I think, um, you know, for me, 
like I've got a gallery at the top of Fish Lane Aboriginal Art Co, selfish plug, um, not for profit um, Aboriginal Art Gallery at the top of Fish Lane, so Julius Pizza, Fish Lane, Aboriginal Art Co, just so you can place yourself. Um, but what I like the most is actually um, people make places, really, and community makes places. And one of the things that I've found about the Fish Lane Precinct and Town Square and actually all of the people that um, operate within that space um, have become friends of ours. So, like, you know, it's... Maybe it's, like, a slight ego thing, but you walk down... I walk down Fish Lane and, you know, um, Alex from Julia's Pizza runs out, Hey, Troy, how are you going? And, you know, every operator comes out and says hello to you because you're part of that community. And part of that community of operators, but also each night um, is kind of a different atmosphere and buzz within that precinct and that town square, um, this really sort of uh, a space that's designed underneath a railway line, you know, um, that's like a green sanctuary and somewhere really comfortable and um, yeah, inviting to inhabit. I think one of the things I'm disappointed about that space is like um, they stopped uh, the power points for charging your phone because like lots of um, in South, not for me, um, in South Brisbane, there's a lot of um, homeless community and um, people occupying that space to charge their phone. And so they've disconnected that. So they're trying to move them on, you know, so. Sorry, that was a, like a bit of a Debbie Downer on a really so are you, nice. So, are you saying Fish Lane as well? Yeah, Fish okay, Lane. Okay, all right. Do you want to have two? Because Audrey had two. No, just one. Two. Okay, fish right. Lane. Okay, Cat. Fish Lane. Um, no, I'm going to take two. Okay, go on. So, I would say Goma, without a doubt. I mean, Goma to me was a gesture of understanding that. Um, Embracing culture is a really big part of identity and what I love about Goma is whenever I I will travel to Brisbane to go to Goma I think it's such an outstanding art gallery and I also think it's very open to everyone So it's not a kind of space where you feel excluded and the way they curate that gallery has always been exceptional um, Like the triennial a number of years ago was such an important uh, retrospective of um, you know, uh, First Nations art, and I, I just, I, I just personally love it, and I think that's a sign of great city making, where you don't have to intellectualise it; you just really feel a heartfelt connection to it. So I would say Goma, and no one's mentioned James Street, and kind of has to be in there, doesn't it? So, I mean, James Street is such a good piece of urban design, and both of those I think are worth mentioning because I feel like they're not trying to emulate other cities. They're just Brisbane, and I think this is very important for Brisbane. Brisbane is a wonderful city in its own right, and it doesn't need to try and pretend to be anything other than what it is. And I, for me, both of those places, when people ask me what is what is Brisbane, and I agree Howard Smith was, but I find those two places kind of set Brisbane on a course of confidence in itself as a city, and I think yeah, they're both very important and influential developments. Okay, cool. Thank you, Kat. Thank you all. Audrey. We have a very humid tropical climate here, <laughs> I guess I'm feeling. Um, it's actually much more humid in Sydney at the moment, it's absolutely dripping. It's easy to build a brand new building that could sit in any city in the world. Um, how do we connect uh, the new or repurposed building to the climate here without adding to its uh, destruction? Do you mean destruction to the climate? Yeah, destruction to the climate, but also, yeah, I guess, removing the building. Yeah, well, Troy and I have had an interesting conversation about that, um, uh, just about demolition waste and, and actually that demolition waste is country and then when you move it on from country and take it to the landfill site, you're actually potentially taking it to somebody else's country and, and Troy posed the question to me, what's the process for exchange in that and there isn't one. So I think that's the beginning of that. I think uh, subtropical climate now, what it's going to be like in five, ten years, I'm not sure. Um, so I think the question is how do we design buildings for a changing climate? Mm. And uh, yeah, that can be a multitude of different things, but I think the, the thing that springs to mind the most is, I'll give you two examples. One is 
um, a building that we've been working on recently which has specific uh, ESD targets that it's trying to meet. So it's got its five and a half star neighbours, it's got its uh, six star green star buildings, but it's also, um, because we're in a subtropical climate, they wanted to introduce mixed mode ventilation down in the bottom layers. And uh, they designed this building where the bottom layers are eroded. So it kind of, bl it kind of is almost grounded in country, yeah. And, um, and they called it the Rainforest Tower, but I actually think it's more like a mangrove, which I think is much more apt about Brisbane. And if we talk about climate, we talk about carbon, and then we talk about mangroves. It's a really nice connection. So um, that mixed mode ventilation played havoc with our neighbor's rating, which was really tricky. But um, we just kind of widened the temperature bands of that and, um, and did some further modeling, and that was good. Uh, it's kind of worked out, but uh, so that's one way. So that, uh, you know, aligning it with the Brisbane City Council Buildings That Breathe guidelines is really an important document, I think, because it has all those passive principles right from the get-go. Pointing the building in the right direction is a good start. And, um, and also there was another example that, I, that sprung to mind was, uh, you know, from a developer point of view where they've actually set, um, the, the, it's a residential building, they've set the apartments back from the facade and so that's enabled, uh, a, a, it's lessened the, the living interior floor plate but it's enabled an outdoor living element to those apartment blocks and what they've done is invested in the the glass actually being like a concertina. So they can open that right up and invite those cross breezes through and then they've put a, a door, like a screen door as a security door on the front door and allows that cross ventilation to happen. But what was interesting about that was it had another social impact as well. So during COVID, those neighbors in that apartment block were able to open those screen doors, get that cross ventilation happening and have a conversation with each other. So mm. I think that was that was it as well. But to answer your question, <laughs> 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 sorry, um, it has to be designing for a changing climate and you need to bring as much nature back into our urban environments as possible. So uh, we need to reduce that urban heat island effect and uh, cr start creating and thinking about designing places that offer refuge, respite, uh, for our entire population, not just a few. So uh, designing with uh, a, an element of giving in that space as well, I think is important. Thank you, Audrey. Uh, Troy, um, First, Nation, um, First Nations people have been caring for and living on the country uh, for more than 60,000 years. What in your eyes can make that more of a genuine voluntary way of working between First Nations people and community and the built environment professionals? What a big question for three yeah. minutes of a response. Yeah. Um, 45 minutes tonight. So, um, all right, big sigh. So caring for country, um, we often talk, I'm gonna put this beer down, sorry, hang on. Um, we often talk about, you know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, have an obligation to care for country as part of our cultural protocols and value systems. So like we don't necessarily get to choose that. Um, but we have an obligation to ensure that um, our grandchildren's great-grandchildren um, are able to live in a similar environment, hopefully not anymore, but like back when, uh, before all of the, the dramas that we're facing at the moment, that our grandchildren's great-grandchildren could live in a similar environment, have the same resources um, that we do now. And so our responsibility to harvest sustainably, hunt sustainably, um, and ensure that we cared and maintained f of um, that part of country um, was critical to our ongoing survival and thrival. Um, what we face now is an opportunity to look back at the ways in which, maybe it's a value system actually, um, that First Nations people carry in relation to sustainability, um, in relation to caring for country, and you can't also think about the impacts of climate change without thinking about First Nations values. So it's like this really big alignment of like, how do we look backwards to move forwards in a positive way when we think about this place, um, this country, the globe, you know? Um, I think one of the things that I'm really interested in in this is that, and maybe I'm answering question two a little bit, but like designing with country is actually about um, 
connecting with community who live locally and who are the custodians of the country that we live on. So traditional custodians of Turrbal and Yagara country who um, have cared for this place since time immemorial. Um, to engage them in conversations about this place, um, to think about regenerative design, to think about reinstating ecosystems and ecologies that once existed in this place so that it can thrive again. Um, interesting fact on the, the project you were talking about, you know, if you're building a, a tower that's 36 storeys tall, what's its responsibility to the country that it digs up? i.e. what we were talking about, the chain of custody of materiality when it goes to another place. Mm. Or, you know, people like Brickworks are looking at that waste that's being dug up and reusing it in bricks. So what's the development's responsibility to use the percentage of bricks that you can make out of that waste and just put it back in the development? Creatives are really smart, figure out a way. Um, but if it's going up, how does it capture and harvest rainwater? How does it recycle and reuse that? How do you make sure that um, you can try and build little ecosystems on the way up? And also, one billion birds in America alone die each year from flying into buildings. A billion birds in America wow. alone. What's the responsibility of a tower to minimize bird strike? I don't know engineers and stuff figure it out like you know i think one of the real critical components of all of this conversation is like we say we have an obligation everyone in this room who's a designer or an engineer or into sustainability if you have the ability to make change what is your responsibility on every project that's beautiful um, i think it's also just avoiding that kind of just token doing tokenly doing it you know absolutely i think if you're going to do it on a project it needs to be authentic and genuine otherwise don't do it mm. you know i'm struggling with i'll wait for question two actually i did read them luca so <laughs> <laughs> so that's wrap let's wrap that up no um cat um you've been working on place branding for decades um people have positive and negative remarks on every city in the world um where is brand Brisbane at at the moment? And we can't just talk about the Olympics coming up because it's so much more than that. Yeah, and I think, I think there's a lot of mistakes and misperceptions about what place branding is and what it's for. And um, because it's not a substitute for what a place really is. Do you know what I mean? It's not meant to be going, oh, we've now rebranded Brisbane and it's now X and it was Y. Like uh, a place is authentically what its people find it to be and it's authentically what its, you know, environment and, you know, natural life is as well. But the discipline of place branding, uh, in my experience, is most effective when it's used to solve a communication problem, right? So it's not about, oh, how do we embody everything Brisbane is at a place in a logo? Like to me, that's a very um, superficial understanding of what place branding should be trying to achieve. And some of the best work we've done in place branding has been about being very clear, what is the problem that we're trying to overcome through that work? So. Brisbane, I think one of the biggest problems Brisbane has is that the reputation of Brisbane is out of step with the reality. It's not keeping pace with the rate of change in the city or what that city aspires to be. So that needs to be dealt with head on through a strategic strategy to you know, embody the real um, Brisbane in an authentic way. And as I said, I don't think that that's just, oh, let's create a new logo or it's now this colour. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And, and so in our work, we try and really get under the skin of what's the key communication problem or task of the work and then for what is the solution creatively and strategically. And that way you will shift perceptions because that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to manage a perception gap and you're trying to move it to where you want that perception to be. So yeah, I, I, I think there's, there's nothing, I mean, Brisbane to me is a wonderful place. I think the 
It's actually, interestingly enough, a number of years ago we worked on rebranding Redfern and Redfern, again, was already an authentic place but it had a big image problem. It doesn't have that problem, I feel, so much anymore. And so we understood diagnostically a lot of people were actually scared of Redfern. They didn't feel comfortable there for a variety of reasons so we're able to actually address that head on rather than trying to embody the many dimensions of what Redfern is which the people from that place already understand that. We don't have to re-communicate that and repackage it. So yeah, I guess the key thing is how do we embody the real Brisbane for people, its aspirations as a city and how do we do that in a way that genuinely drives the type of change the city wants to achieve rather than it being a kind of inauthentic, let's stick a new brand on it and therefore, you know, will change how people see it i think yeah there's a lot of great work that's already being done but there's still a great opportunity to kind of really identify what is that perceptual gap and how do we move it forward so is it your fault redfern so expensive now <laughs> we can't we used to have our offices Sorry, there was totally it is our a, fault it you was know, a joke I, we, we, I we to used God. to have our studio in redfern and we had to move out we can't afford it either yeah, but um yeah it is I'll, I'll i'll yeah I apologise for that, Troy, sorry. No, <laughs> literally, I... Yeah. COVID, I hate talking about COVID because it seems like such a long time ago. And But COVID has had a major effect on uh, us at the time and how we are today. And a lot of people, I don't know how many people work sometimes hybrid working from home or in the office. There's a lot of that going on. Um, how do we encourage, how do we foster, what makes a great place that fosters community as opposed to for enforcing it? Yeah, I think a lot of the time when we talk about um, uh, the, like, the work that we do is that I think uh, like Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in this country are obviously um, the least fortunate um, due to the impacts of colonisation. And so, you know, lots of places and spaces in this country have either been built to keep us out or built to keep us in, if you think about jails. Mm. Um, you know, so how do we um, think about places that um, become, uh, you know, comfortable or more um, accessible for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? And I think every, that means everyone would feel comfortable, I would imagine. Um, so if you're using that as the baseline, I mean, like, I talk about these places and spaces that have been made to keep us out. If you think about Boundary Street here in Brisbane, I would hopefully imagine at least 50% of this audience knows this story, but I'm going to say it anyway. You know, at 5 p.m. Um, before the referendum, even up until those times in, in 67, um, that Aboriginal people weren't allowed into the CBD. So at night in the evenings at 5 p.m., the police would round any Aboriginal people who were in the CBD outside of Boundary Street. And there's still these really old, interesting concrete boundary pillars all along Boundary Street um, in Brisbane. And so even some of the major infrastructure in these cities up until recent times, i.e. like my parents' and grandparents' times, these places have been made and, and designed to exclude us. So now we're in this really interesting position where everyone wants to like make it inclusive for Aboriginal people. And so like we're getting, you know, wheeled out <laughs> to try and help create that change. Um, I think, you know, if you think about the Closing the Gap report, healthcare, jobs, all of those things, if we're designing to create better places for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, they'll be better places for everyone. Cool, thank you, Troy. Audrey, the way that we develop, um, the way development is structured due to the cost of entry uh, is to maximize available floor, floor space on a site how do we shift to assessing the site and opportunity for what it is and what needs to change from a legislative perspective to do so? Do we need to build at all? I think that's a really hard question. Um, and I was speaking to Amy, <laughs> Amy before uh, about this and I think the first, I think we do need to build. You know, we've got a rising population. We've got people who uh, have no access to housing. I think we, we're in the middle of a, an affordable housing a crisis. So we do need to build, but I suppose 
uh, that's equated to growth and then we have to ask well what kind of growth are we talking about here so there's two things I mean you you've kind of aligned that question to new buildings so if it's new buildings we have to talk about um, uh, from a legislative point of view I think uh, Industry is de definitely leading the charge, whereas legislation needs to catch up a little bit, but it's starting to. So we're seeing with the compliance driven, driven tools, they're starting to catch up to put in further requirements on what those new buildings need to aspire to in terms of uh, sustainability initiatives. Um, we've got, uh, you know, I think there's room for uh, developers to actually take a step back and have a think about how how they're approaching a site. And we've had a recent uh, experience where uh, there was an expectation in a, in a precinct in South Brisbane, Kirilpa precinct, where uh, the council have set some uh, requirements for uh, the planning process. And part of that planning process is accelerated. Uh, there's a higher, um, you know, you can build taller buildings, but one of the prerequisites to enter into that planning process is that you have to commit to doing a five-star, green-star buildings building. Um, and that's, that's been a very rigorous conversation because five-star, green-star buildings, as I'm sure you're all, you're all aware, are, is actually quite difficult to achieve. It's very different to, from design and as built. And it's got much more of a social sustainability perspective as well, which can be easy to say, but difficult to manifest in, a, in an authentic and tangible way in the built environment. So it's a big commitment to ask developers to do, but I think it's, it's a, a good thing. And obviously the quid pro quo was they get to build taller buildings. So one of the developers that went is trying to go through that process at the moment, they actually had a, a land size that uh, where they could build four towers, and instead of building four, they've chosen to build three. And they've, uh, they were asked to allocate 200 square meters back to the public realm, well, they're allocating 3,000 square meters back to the public realm and creating a park which aligns with the blue grid river at the front and the green grid behind. But it's not altruistic because they've opened up that north part of the, the plot and what that does is give them a much deeper daylight penetration, they have much more opportunity for uh, solar, on-site solar generation because of that north facing facade, which means that the, the premium, the, the price of those apartments will actually rise because they can introduce some of those health and wellness factors into it. So what they've achieved there is actually in the, those robust conversations in a regulatory environment is a bit of a win-win situation. Uh, but it's good because they also have uh, very aspirational ESG targets and that S in that ESG is often uh, elusive. And so by allocating this space back to the public realm, uh, they've gone part way to achieving that S. And I suppose off the back of the document that was released by Green Star uh, Green Building Council last week, which was the social impact in the built environment, the next step would then be to actually ask that community what, what it is that they want in that public realm. So that would be great. Um, but let's see if they do that. As far as uh, existing buildings, it's an interesting one because I think, um, uh, you know, that old adage, the most sustainable building is the one that already exists, and that's true because of all that embodied carbon that is existent in that building, that's great. And I suppose looking out onto the, the cityscape of Brisbane, there's huge opportunity there. Um, for developers to actually, or, or you know, who are sitting on a portfolio of buildings that are not quite up to scratch, if they don't start positioning themselves to actually bring them up to code, they're, they're just dead buildings because the requirements for those uh, shareholders or those larger corporations who are going to tenant those spaces, uh, their ESG targets that they have to meet themselves, including the government as of 2026, every building that the government occupies has to be net zero. So that requirement is going to come through for a lot of cor uh, bigger corporates as well. So there's a lot of stranded assets out there if they don't start getting their shit together now to actually retrofit those buildings. But when you pull the lid off those buildings and you see the cost involved in retrofitting them, and el electrifying is one thing, but retrofitting the building to bring it up to code for a commercial building is going to be really expensive. So then, is that building 
that was built for a specific purpose back then, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, is that in the urban context that is now still the same? So, or do we redefine that building and make it into something else? Giving it back to the public realm for micro industries to take on a makerspace situation or uh, you know, cents in the dollar rather than, or cents in the square meter rather than dollars. Detroit has got that example, which I think is really successful. Or do they open it up for, you know, residences for an, an affordable housing crisis? So do they redefine those buildings and actually start changing that inner city urban core and activating it in that way and creating bigger density in, in the city space? So that was really long-winded, sorry. No, no, it's a really good answer. Um, we're working on a project in London. It's a, a tower that is only 15 years old and they're already talking about it's, it's okay. gonna beyond its use by date because of the such stringent sustainable uh, ratings and practice that have to happen now. It's quite incredible. Yeah, my favorite building of all time is a building that's 400 years old on the banks of Loch Eck in Scotland. And it was built as an inn and it still exists as an inn. So it was built for purpose. Um, it was, if you pulled it apart and pull, pulled out the you know, electrical cable, it would be built for deconstruction because it would just <laughs> melt back into the landscape. Yeah. And so, you know, I think, and I remember as a kid going there and, um, uh, you know, there was singers in the corn, there was a fire going and I'd be pulling out the wool that was then insulation out of the walls. Um, so we can do things differently. We've done it before, we can, we can do it again, but it's, it's just, it's a worldview that's embedded on how we do business and that's mm. the thing that we're challenged with, that yeah. we need to change that. We're all working on pro projects, everybody's working on different projects um, all around the place and I kind of wonder Michael is there is someone got a bigger vision for Brisbane um, generally in terms of architecture and design yes yeah, so, so maybe as a as a thread between the, the various conversations and, and answers the if, if we look back let's say 2,500 years. 2,500 years ago, uh, the local indigenous mob were building houses on sticks or stumps, as we call them now. They were well ventilated, uh, wood louvers. You know, they, they basically, the, the, the blueprint for the Queenslander. We then went through a period, uh, 1940s onward, where we tried to hermetically seal everything against the climate. So mm. we, we actively started to work against yeah. our natural environment. We've now come full circle to a project, uh, you know, the, the QIC project that you guys have been a part of, where you have operable louvered windows right up to the top of the building because people are recognizing what's old is, is new. And isn't it great that we're all cognizant of doing these things, but we actually, we have that knowledge. And I think it's, the, the, the thread really is that the knowledge never went away. And actually, if we start to look back in, in my context, uh, the, the Canadian context, there was always planning seven generations back, seven generations forward. The local context here is your, your children's children's children you know, these, these things exist. We just, ref we're not seeing them. It's like being a, a horse or a greyhound in a race and having blinders on. And while we strive for these amazing technological advances, it's actually the low-tech solutions mm -hmm. that are providing the most, uh, the, the biggest bang for your butt. I think one of the things uh, which is helping that is something that actually ADP uh, have been working on uh, quietly in the background which is a, a parametric tool that costs environmental uh, performance as part of the early, uh, early performer. So we all know Giraffe, we all know some of the parametric modeling tools that are out there. If you actually start to strip that back and then add in things like solar gain, uh, add in the cost of uh, combined heat and power distribution systems, you know, you're then upfront able to tell people what's going on, what the cost impact will be. And you know, all of that's grand, and I'm very hopeful for the future, but just to tie something back to what Kat was saying earlier about Brand Brisbane, because I think it's an important discussion. Um, 
when I first moved to Brisbane, uh, you know, several years ago now, but we, we did a thing uh, at uh, Brisbane City Council asked me to come to the powerhouse and facilitate an event. Uh, at the event uh, was a company called Ludo. Nobody knew who, who they were. There was no uh, production company behind it at that point. And it was for the early stakeholder consultations on what became the kind of character housing guide. And so these two animators who were really, really nerdy and kind of fully into their thing showed this reel of Bluey. It was the wheelbarrow episode. And uh, for anybody here with kids or adults that watch Bluey. Uh, and everybody's eyes were transfixed. They just, you know, they were like, this is Brisbane. This is character housing. This is our identity. So somehow they became super famous. BBC bought them, you know, all, all of this in the meantime, although they remain true to their roots. And when I find myself thinking about the question, what is Brisbane's identity? I can watch any Bluey episode and see Brisbane's identity. The early mornings in the wheelbarrow, walking to the shops, the, 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 the difference, you know, going to different parks or playing in the creek or doing really basic stuff. And so the, the thread is that you have this series of animated shows which are actually quintessentially Brisbane's identity and what makes us very unique, and it is utterly basic. And so when we stop trying to worry about what Sydney's doing, Melbourne's doing, London's doing, New York's doing, Vancouver, Toronto, and start to look at what we have and realize that the reason it's great is because it's all here on a plate. What we don't have is the impetus uh, or the kind of the, you know, the oomph behind it right now to make us really, really awesome. We, we're still looking beyond our own borders for what's great. And so my, my point is, and I love using Bluey as a reference, you know, it, it's such a good one because it's, it is simple. It is all of the things that are tangible, everyday, early breakfast, 5 a.m., out with the kids in the morning because it's 4 a.m. and it's bright and the bloody birds are going. That's all, all Brisbane. And so when we stop looking for our identity and start embracing our identity and looking, not looking to kind of innovate our way out of it, I think we actually have the bones of a great city. There's several projects around this city which are amazing and, and really going to be game changers in terms of you know, what we do, but what's gonna make them game changers is if they don't try to be something else than what we what we already are. So as much as I like Vigo and, and Henning Larson and the, and the work they do, we don't need uh, we don't need Copenhagen and Brisbane. We need Copenhagen's know-how of simple tools invested in a local practice, in that case architectus, to really sing what is our identity and to work with you know, people like Troy and others to say, hang on, let's not overcook the chicken here. Let's, you know, what are we trying to achieve and what do we want people to think about it? And uh, so it doesn't directly answer your question, Vince, I appreciate that, but when I have to think about what's the best project or what's the coolest thing going, there is so many cool things going. We just happen to be a very disaggregated city that needs to come together at ground or at country, if you like, mm -hmm. and, and start to tie it all together so mm -hmm. that, you know, from, a, from a, a customer journey point of view or whatever you want to call it, we start to thread the needle and have a city where each moment is celebrated, not just bits and pieces here and there. And we have then, a wor you know, we have that, that world city that we've mm -hmm. tried to aspire to be. Mm -hmm. Anyway, sorry, a bit no, of a no. long answer, but Good. there you go. I'm going to look out for Blueys too. I'm going to watch that tonight. Can I, I can cannot I believe, Vince, <laughs> you haven't seen Blue. Well, I haven't seen it either, but I saw my local Bunnings change their what? logo, and I went, who, Why are these people who, who is responsible for that? That doesn't work. But anyway. You mean Hammer Barnes? Yeah, oh. It. Stop it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're, <laughs> we're close to wrapping it up. We've got five minutes left. Kat, another question for you. Um, when we're talking about cities, branding, and places, etc. We're talking about all from all ages, like from the moment you're born to the moment you die. Um, we talked the other day about ageism and um, how is that affecting the national built environmental sector? Well, it's very interesting because we're doing more and more work in the, um, I hate to even say it, kind of the seniors sector. <laughs> um, 
even the notion that you have a senior sector is a bit is a bit strange. Um, and it's interesting what you were saying, Troy, before about how our First Nations people were excluded because it's kind of happening the same to our older mm. populations. Like rather than seeing people who are older as just a, a normal part of society, and we're talking about baby boomers who don't want to be infantilized, like fed mushy food and treated like they're not capable people. Um, but the way that we're dealing with our aging population, which is becoming a bigger and bigger problem, if you like, or challenge for urban centres, is to kind of ostracise them, infant- infantilise them, and discriminate in very significant ways. And it's interesting, I was speaking to an expert last week, and they were saying, like, ageism is the only ism that's still okay. You know, like uh, we can talk about older people and we often, it's so deeply ingrained in our perceptions of society that um, like I even find it myself, you start apologising for yourself as you age, like that you are no longer kind of current or able to be kind of uh, part of mainstream society, like you're being aged out and pushed out, literally by how we're dealing with our older people. And um, the, the great pity about this is this isn't everywhere in the world. <laughs> it's something that we've become, we're becoming increasingly uh, good at <laughs> in Australia. And it's very bad for society to, in, in any shape or form, start to segregate its people into different groups. What makes a great community is integration, mm. is having lots of different people together and to not kind of classify them in ways that ignore that everyone's an individual. Like nobody wants to be classified. And it's interesting in the work that we've been doing in seniors living, like when you try and do market research around it even, people go, that's not for me. I never want to be uh, in one of those places. Um, so yeah, there's in the same way that we have quite significant challenges facing us with housing, we have significant challenges facing us in how we deal with all the different parts of our society. And I think that one of the problems that we have is that often the people who are in the driver's seats making decisions do not have true empathy for social diversity. Uh, They see it through a very monocultural or very, um, like, very specific to their own uh, socioeconomic circumstances and they don't really deal with the broad dimensions of the wonderful rich society we live in. So yeah, it's interesting, like I think that this conversation around ageism is going to continue to increase um, because it's going to be something that's a lived reality for all of us that we can't just sort of get rid of (laughs) or put somewhere our older people and it, that's to our detriment, to everyone's detriment. We want to have rich, diverse places where everyone feels like they equally belong and this expert I was speaking to was saying even just in the workplace, the next thing we're going to see is championing the rights of older people and encouraging much more diverse teams where you have older people working with younger people and the same way now that we're starting to understand that if we have workplaces that are representative of all the diversity of gender, of gender identity, of, you know, all these different things, they make for good workplaces in the same way. We're going to start having that conversation about older people because people are living longer and we don't want to send people out to pasture at the age of 60 or 65 because that's not economically viable, but also it's a huge loss of, you know, what we know from our First Nations people, elderhood, you know, there's so much to learn from older people, um, and yeah, we need to con- we need to significantly revisit how we're viewing their role within our society. I totally, I totally Remembering agree. Remembering, Vince, you are 67. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, we've got to sort this out quick. Putting you out to pasture. You aged yourself, Vince, actually. Just, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. 67. Jeez, I'm uh-huh. But yeah, like, but can, I, I, can I just, I just add, add one add thing? Yeah. yeah, I mean, like, uh, it's really funny that we think about like um you know as people get older they become out of the know um whereas it's like kind of the opposite (laughs) 
yeah. um, in our cultural uh, uh, value system where actually um, elderhood and elders um, are the people who hold the knowledge yeah. and have the responsibility to pass that on and they don't pass it on just to Joe Bloggs who turns up and goes, tell me where the best fishing spot is. You know, you actually have to earn the knowledge to be transferred and so like the intergenerational exchange for First Nations communities has always been like critical to our survival. Whereas now it's like, oh, yeah, I'll go to the home and we'll get on with things. I mean, yeah, it's, I, get, I guess I keep, we keep circling back to this like old ways new, you know, like how do we, you know, for me, like I would be absolutely um, stoked to be able to spend more time with my elders to get that transfer of knowledge back on my country out in Camilleroy country, which is in northwest New South Wales. But I am fortunate enough to spend lots of time here with local Aboriginal elders in Turrbal and Yagara country and, and, and be trusted enough to get some of that knowledge exchange. But yeah, it's, it's really interesting because what happens is that knowledge stops getting passed on yeah. if you don't continue to respect that section of our community and you know, then this, the language gets lost, the stories get lost. Like, you know, I think it's important to keep keep that fire burning, certainly. I totally agree. That, that sharing across society, I think any project that we work on, um, and you guys were doing that too, it's like, I remember sitting, watching um, a while back uh, when my kids were in uh, play school, I uh, got friendly with the principal and he said, could you design us the brand, rebrand our school? <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, no budget, of course. Um, and I remember going back to the studio and one of our designers, like 28 at the time, bald like me, covered in tattoos, um, he, he was briefed to design it. And, and naturally he would start to kind of design in, I guess in a way, you know, has good intentions, but he naturally went into kind of cliche territory because he's not a six-year-old or a three-year-old. Um, and you can't imagine, how can you design something that's relevant for a kid of that age, you know? You naturally design as a 28-year-old. And, and I think what's, what I'm trying to say is, we always have to, we need to dig deeper in who we're designing places and brands and experiences for. People would say it's the customer or, you know, a customer experience and things like that. We kind of dehumanize it often in the conversation. I think it's really important to rehumanize the conversation, to design better outcomes for real people and knowing that each and every one of us is different and individual and how do we kind of tailor for that? Can I yeah, I want to add to that. I think that's a really great point. <laughs> um, because I think people who are talking a lot about ESG, what is ESG, what does it mean, what, you know, and they're chasing that S. And the next conversation that I hear is how do we quantify it? And it's like, well, sure, we can quantify it in lots of different ways. But I think it's the qualification of it that actually is going to give us the, the juice and the really interesting parts. It's not just... And I think Well, the Institute of, um, mm. of Well, they're actually starting to make room for that qualitative data to come through in our building and design communities so that, uh, so we're actually asking, if we're designing precincts, if we're designing buildings, um, if we're designing uh, retirement living, social housing, whatever it is, whatever sector it belongs to, let's ask the people who are gonna inhabit them yeah. what they think and what they want. From, yeah. those, from those environments. So I think it's a really critical point. Kat, did you want to add something? Well, I was just going to add, I recently joined the, the board of a local charity um, that's a kind of arts organisation in inner Sydney. And like you have to start where you are and you have to do stuff. Like we've mm. done things with people, like First Nations people from our local area. Like, I think sometimes the world feels very unsurmountable and big. Mm. And that's where you have to go, but I have agency. And I actually remember a podcast you did once, Vince, with the head of Greenpeace and talking about the sense of malaise we all often feel about, you know, the world we're facing. And he said, well, find where you can have the biggest impact yeah. and just start there. Yeah, yeah. And so I think that that's a really important thing for all of us to take away from today is you have agency, you can make change. It's not the regulators or the whatever. Like, what, how, are you, how are you focusing your own ability? And I love what you said before, you know, ability, responsibility. I think, 
um, you know, like we all, I think we're in an age where connecting to our hearts and to our feelings and applying that in what we do is a huge opportunity, you know, and so everyone here has agency. We all have an opportunity to work towards what we all believe in and to start in a very personal way, you know, um, something we did recently where we did a collaboration as part of our reconciliation action plan was just sitting down and yarning and just trying to get it onto something personal and meaningful rather than it all being abstract and, you know, <laughs> I, I think that that's where you start really feeling like you can make, make progress is when you take it into who you are, you know, so that, yeah, I guess that's building on what you were saying. Yeah, let's get real people involved and make sure they understand they have agency. Thank you. Thank you for sitting here and, and uh, partaking in this, this chat. Uh, thanks to all the guests as well for um, their contribution to the conversation. Um, really enjoyed it. All the support around making this happen as well. It's been phenomenal. Um, stick around as long as you want to. Have a few more drinks, a few more chats as well. I forgot to mention Sarah. Sarah's part of our team there too, standing at the back there. Um, but have a chat to our team too as well if you want to have uh, you know, more chat about what we do and all that. But uh, thank you all for coming today. It's been wonderful having you guys here. Thanks. Thank you.